uh, hopefully we can start very soon I think we can start now. Almost uh, 30 plus participants and uh, 12 more in the panelists, so in total around 50. So we can start. And Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salam alaikum wa rasulullah. Welcome to ICI SCT 2022 International Conference on Innovations in Science, Engineering, and Technology 2022. Uh, this conference is a multidisciplinary international conference organized by Faculty of Science and Engineering in association with the Center of Research and Publication, CRP, of International Islamic University, Chittagong. This is the third time ICI SET is going to take place where the first two rounds of this immensely suc successful conference were held in 2016 and 2018. I am Mohammed Asim Ullah, uh, Faculty of uh, Department of Tripoli, uh, IIUC. So welcoming you to this conference and this is our plenary session one holding on 26 february 2022 saturday so time is starting at 9 a.m bangladesh time and welcoming you all to this conference so during this plenary session one we have the session chairs here uh, professor dr engineer mohebol hog bhuyang from southeast university bangladesh and for session two Professor Dr. Muhammad Abu Yusuf, International Islamic University, Chicago, from Department of Civil Engineering, IAUC, Bangladesh. And uh, our moderator, I myself, and Mohiuddin, he is an assistant professor from Department of CSE, IAUC. And our speakers, main speakers for session one, will be Professor Dr. Tech Lee, he is the deputy head of his school, Auckland University of Technology, Electrical and Electronic Engineering, Auckland. New Zealand. And for session two, Professor Dr. Faisal Hussain, fellow AMS from John R. Kelly and Dort Professor, Civil and Environment Engineering from University of Washington, Seattle, USA. So I will leave to our uh, first session chair, Professor Dr. Engineer Mohebal Hogbuya, who will lead the session, first session. And for first session, our main speaker is Professor Dr. Techley, who happens to be, I, I can see the many students here uh, from my students. Uh, and for them, the short information is that he is my PhD supervisor and I've been benefited from him. So many things I was benefited during the year 2015 to 2019. And uh, it will be a very interesting talk. So I will leave to our, our main Session chair for the first session, Professor Dr. Engineer Mohabil Hogboya. Please sir, start and uh, our session starts with first session starts from here. Okay, thank you, Dr. Asimullah, uh, for inviting me to be the uh, chair of this session of the third international conference of innovations in science, engineering, and technology. So I am very happy and feel honored to chair this session. And before inviting Professor Lee, I would like to introduce him uh, to the audience. Uh, 
Professor Tek Jing Li, if I pronounce it <laughs> correctly. <laughs> okay. Tek Jing Li received his uh, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Oklahoma State University, U USA, in 1986. He also received his master's of science and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Michigan State University, USA, in 1988 and 1992, respectively. Professor Lee is the deputy head of the School of Engineering, Computer Science, uh, Computer and Mathematical Sciences, Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. His research interests include power system control and operation, AI applications in power systems, deregulated power systems, smart grids, microgrids, renewable energy systems, and energy management systems. He has authored or co-authored more than 250 journal and international conference papers. So this is his short introduction. So his topic of presentation is hierarchical control strategies for DC microgrid clusters, a review. So I would like to invite him, but before that, I would like to remind all of you that there are total 90 minutes for this plenary session, and there are two speakers, so around 45 minutes for each speakers, and maybe 30 minutes for the presentation and 15 minutes, maybe for the, more or less 15 minutes for the question and answer session. So to save some time, we can, but I can request all of you, uh, if you have question, you can write down your questions in the question and answer uh, chat box, and we can pick the questions and then speakers will answer to the questions. So now let us invite Professor Tek Jing Li to introduce, uh, to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and Asim for the introductions. Um, I'd like to share my uh, screen. Yeah, Asim, you have to unshare your screen so that... Okay. Yes, sir, it's already answered. Okay, I'll yeah. do that. Okay, uh, thank you very much and good morning to you all. Uh, it's been a privilege and honor that, you know, have given opportunity to present to you my current research uh, uh, in terms of hierarchical control strategy for DC microgrid clusters, because this is a very, it, it is being funded by the New Zealand government for the next seven years. Uh, so this is something that we have to look at and start working on it, where when we are talking about New Zealand being 100% renewable in terms of generation of electricity in uh, 2050. So that's the targets that we are going. So what we are looking at is more, okay, how much that we can do, whether we can have a DC system or, or AC system or hybrid AC-DC. So in, in this presentation, I'm looking at around a DC microgrids and then what can, what are the trend, what are the control strategies that is happening uh, presented or being published or it's been doing so what, we are looking at different kind of aspect. And at the end of the presentation, I will give a little bit of insight. What are the opportunities then things that, you know, we can pursue uh, and all, some of you can actually, if you're interested, you can actually pursue that too. We have, uh, before I do that, I think some brief bio data about myself has been introduced where so all that my educations are pretty much all in America. And I also have uh, some kind of postgraduate diploma of, uh, in terms of teaching of higher education from Nanyang Technological University. So I was a uh, research associate for a year after my PhD. And then I, I was working uh, from in Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, like more than around 15 to 16 years before I settled down in, in 
down under or New Zealand in Auckland University of Technology since 2008. So that's pretty much what my uh, background is. Okay, this is pretty much what you're looking at, you know, it's pretty much on the microgrid clusters. What does that mean? So this is what we are going to look at. So first of all, we know that all these fossil fuels uh, is not going to last, you know, and then the climate change and a lot of other electrification that is happening in the world with the electric vehicles and, and all other aspects of, of electrifications. And then in addition of that, we have a lot of new technologies in terms of renewable energy. So the penetration has been increased and so on. And the demands of electricity has been increased as well. However, the trend is we are not going to build something like before, you know, it's a power plant which is centralized because at this time of the, uh, for now, actually the generation is following the load. It's not the, you know, it's not like uh, load following the generation. So in that way, it has been built in terms of, because of the, of the technology of, of renewable uh, resources, we can actually put it nearer to the loads. However, we need to have a lot of that around. So we have to have some kind of clusters, okay? Uh, uh, instead of building one, but they're all very close to each other. So we need to have something being built as a clusters. Now, if what are the things that make it work? Because you have different microgrids, we have different, their own control uh, things. So we have to make sure they are talking to each other. So somehow we can coordinate so that they can work as synchronously. So this is something that we are looking at. Now, in terms of microgrids here, we are, they are, as I mentioned earlier, they are DC, they are AC, they are also hybrid AC-DC. So what we focus on this talk, as I mentioned, because of the 100% uh, renewable future. So I'm more interested in terms of a DC, you know, only in this case, we're looking at a DC microgrid uh, and see what we, we see in terms of the clusters where you actually try to uh, share the power as well as how we regulate the voltage among them. Okay, so we are looking at different control schemes and also uh, different type of things that has been done uh, in terms of control aspect. So this is pretty much what we see in terms of DC microgrids. So you got fuel cell, photovoltaics, farm, wind farm, EV stations, batteries, supercapacitors, and some of the DC residential load. So again, we have a lot of hard uh, high penetrations of renewable energy, you know, beside because all these expansion in terms of the electrifications. So you have a lot high demand of power. So we have to supply with all these renewable because you do not want to build up more power plant with the fossil fuels or, or, or coal power plants. So we want to make sure the climate change is under control and all that. So that's why uh, we have a lot of microgrids, a lot of this uh, renewable, and some of them have problem because of the intermittency, like for, especially where you're looking at photovoltaics and wind. So their, their output is intermittent, is, is very highly intermittent because it's all based on nature. Okay, so it's very hard to control. So we need to, somehow overcome that. So this will increase the operating efficiency in terms of economy and, and also the flexibility to do that. Now, in order to make it work, we have to make sure all these microgrids being coordinated, okay, in a manner that you can have 
uh, uh, somehow to to make it balance, you know, so that you have able to control the voltage in in uh, globally, as well as you can share some of the power around. Okay, now can we be done? If it is, how? So this is what we are looking at. Okay, so what we're looking at in this case is is because of our depend less dependency in terms of classical grid, we are looking at adopting a new way because of the high penetration of renewables to produce with the, so we adopt what we call a microgrid clusters to produce reliables and continuous power. In the inside or outside in a remote area, it doesn't matter because you can always have that. So what we're looking at is, is this is the significance of that study that we are going to look into. Now, in order to do that, we have to go through some what are the existing uh, works that's been done in terms of the control strategies. So we have four different kinds of control strategies. You're looking at this one. The central part is the centralized control method is one. So you have DC grids clusters here. You've got centrally control, and it, everything go to one way here. If one is fail, then everything will be fails. And then it also is very limited. You cannot expand it. If, if you have more microgrid, you cannot have you we have more problems. And then you had to have that good communication lines. You know, the high bandwidth is important, is, has to be done. It's also very vulnerable to significant disturbance. And this is going to be difficult because you're looking at the wind, you're looking at the photovoltaic, you can have a big significant disturbance, then you've got a problem with that. The other part is what we call decentralized okay so which is this this part of a, of the configurations decentralized the good thing is about it it has you don't need to have that communication okay and of course with that you have reduced your costs and there's no problem with the delay in terms of communication because you, you there is no communication at all However, it does not support play, plug and play functionality. Okay, you cannot just replace thing uh, when it's something in and out. You know, you cannot do that. And then you have no idea what the other systems are doing. You know, or, or the status of it because there is no no communication, no connections. The next one is more like distributed control methods. It's on this side. Okay, this part, the good points are sparse communication networks, okay? And you have an exchange of data among, among the microgrids. The good, no good things, you may have problem with the communication uh, delays because sometimes, you know, because of that certain uh, bandwidth, you may not get the, communication uh, information in on time, then you may have problem with that. And then you may, as I said, you can have a failure in terms of cyber attack or things like that. Now, the last one is, is more like, I call it hierarchical control method. This is where I'm going to focus on the talks here. It's more like in the hierarchical controls especially in the tertiary control, which is on this part. So it's a layer of controls where you have a primary controls over here, and then the secondary is control on this side, and then this is the uh, tertiary control. So the lay three layers of controls. So you have a lot of uh, uh, good reliables and you have a very smooth operation because Locally, you have your own controls, and then in the secondary and tertiary, you're looking at different ways of controlling 
a different uh, microgrid. Okay, so you you have in, you be able to have that flexibility and very efficient in the sense that you can power, do a power sharing and some of this part over here, which is which is uh, pretty good, but it is challenging because you have to have certain ways. How are you going to do the control of that? So what are the things that we do there? Usually in, in terms of you go back, if I go back to some of the slide here, let me go back. Uh, one more, sorry about that. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, so when you look at this part, this is the tertiary and secondary levels. Oops. Oh no. What is that? Okay. So this is the part that we where we look at the hierarchical, where you got the local, secondary, uh, primary, and secondary and tertiary. The secondary and tertiary, usually we have a distributed uh, control strategies there, where many of them use what we call the consensus protocol. Okay, the consensus protocols here, we're looking at there's a continuous or time trigger and then the event trigger. So this is where I'm going to talk a lot on this part here, on this side. So the current existing work, when the hierarchical control here, we are looking at the global control, which is on the secondary and tertiary, which is all distributed. And most of them, the current thing use consensus protocol, they call it consensus protocols, because it's, it give you a better performance, uh, you know, compared to some other techniques, for example, some uh, PSO, particle swarm optimization, and also some genetic algorithms. So from this part, consensus, we get the continuous control or time trigger control, or there's an event control. There are two different, uh, uh, techniques for the continuous or time is you've got three different techniques as well, three different methods. One is called infinite time, finite time, and fixed time. And then for the event triggers, there's an event trigger and adaptive event trigger. So that's pretty much way it allows, you know, uh, a, a faster way to, to converge without so much of the information of data. Then this is where the, the, the things are going. So the first part of that, we call it time trigger or continuous trigger. So this is, you need a communication link all the time between, oops, uh, between the, the microgrids and then you need those Laplacian metrics, make sure they're all being connected somehow. Okay, you can see all these tie lines is all being with the metrics. Now the time trigger, they got three different things. We call it the fi infinite time, finite time, and fixed time. Okay, so in this case, we look at on these flow charts there, the time trigger, the finite time is very simple, very good, but you have problem with the convergence. Also, it is very prone to any disruptions because again, when you're looking at renewable, especially if you have a PV and wind, there's always uncertainties. So that could be a problem. For finite times, again, it's pretty good in terms of the conversion because that's the first part and then they fix it. Somebody did something with the finite time. They make it simple. They make it better in terms of the regulation, in terms of the convergence, and then also quite resilience. However, it needs some initial conditions, which is a little bit of problems. And then the next work is on a fixed time. Okay, it has improved in terms of the convergence 
And then also, we don't need any initial conditions. And also, the robustness of the cluster improve. However, all these, the last part here, the fixed time I got problem, you know, it, it, uh, it's just a small error, then you have a, a lot of problems as well as also in terms of communication because it's re really heavily rely on the information it has to be accurate, has to be on time. If you have a problem, no accurate or, no, or delay, then there is a problem. On top of that, all these event or time trigger have problem with, you need to have some kind of periodic sample of data. You need to have a global information, you know, of the whole microgrid clusters. And you need a lot of energy to do that. So what is the next one? Event trigger. So this is what is the next phase of the work that can improve from the time trigger because it's, as it said, it's only event trigger. That means it's only work when there's a need. Okay, if there is no event that is happening, then it doesn't need to do anything. The control is still idle. Otherwise, it makes sense. So when you can see here, there's a sensor. If there's some sense, uh, there's something happening, then there's an event being detected. Then you, you put the actuator, move the control, and then there's something going into that. So, okay. So there's a low, low execution in terms of the control uh, work. So as long as there is nothing happening, no events happening, then the control may not work. Uh, you know, you just leave it the, the local control to do to, to, to all the work. Now, from all these part that we have talked about, so I've summarized everything. So these are the opportunities that we, you know, after all this uh, long literature review. So let's uh, let it summarize into this part. So on the gap itself, so you have, as I said earlier, this is, I focus more on the hierarchical uh, control structure where you have the primary. And this primary, usually you have a PI parameters in, in that control. So it, it is very basic, it's a local converters. Every microgrid have the converters and they all something here. I'll show you later on about the results over there. And then in terms of the secondary, where we have oscillation and conversion issue, again, we are doing it with the modified fixed time consensus uh, uh, methods. And we, we is also, sh I'll show you later on. Okay, so this is, when you're looking at the time trigger, these are pretty much all the con, okay, all the disadvantages. So where we have all unit periodic sample, you need global information, and then it consume a lot of energy, very sensitive to small errors, and then very sensitive to communication delay. You need to have a very high frequency of controlling of the controllers update and also computationally take a lot of times. So that's why it become one good way is to put into the event trigger where it is only action when there is need, okay? So you got less data, low energy consumption, low frequency because, you know, it's only happen when there is a need and then limited control, okay? However, you still have problem with the global informations and 
the number of agents. So if you are more, then you got problems. So the solutions for this, we are proposing in, in our work, you're looking at what we call adaptive event trigger controller. So in this case, we have avoiding the global informations. You've got no Xeno behavior. And then precise estimation, what is the trigger periods? And then all the communications burden is reduced. So these are what we are proposing. We are going to, to work on that. Uh, and we are not very sure at this, this moment because it's still in the, in the process whether it's going to work, but we believe it's going to work. Okay, so that's why in the main objective is to try to find a, a very novel hierarchical control strategy, especially in the tertiary control, so that we can try to make sure that this is all the load generations mismatch can be balanced. The fault and fault we can have a voltage uh, regulations and without so much of communication burdens, okay? So this is pretty much what we are looking at, okay? So these are the critical operating condition that we are trying to, to overcome for any faults, any generation loads mismatch, any communication delay, plug and play kind of stuff. So these have impact on the micro clusters. So these are our proposed controllers. So we try to, have the optimal continuations here. So at the end, we have accurate power sharing among microgrid clusters, as well as we have proper global voltage regulation. So these are the objective of the studies. Okay, how are we going to do that? Okay, so of course we have to do go through the literature review. So which we have pretty much going through that. And then after that, you have to develop the, the models. Then you try to do it with the uh, MATLAB or whatever the uh, digital simulation to test it out. And then also we can use the, from that we can verify again into a, a, a real time uh, simulations, okay, uh, with the hardware in the loop kind of thing so you can build a controller then put it in the OPRT or RTDC to run it and then you compare how good is your model if it's not good enough then you try to more uh, to do a bit of tweaking in, in terms of the modeling and try to improve that and make sure if they all pretty much uh, talking about it and then you can write your thesis or whatever or paper for that. Okay, so these are the mathematical model that you're looking at. It's pretty much on this layer here, on the third control layer, okay? Because these are pretty much done for now. So what we are doing now is in this space where you'll need a graph theory. Oh, what happened? You need the graph theory, and then we need to try to formulate the problems and come up with the model and then with the adaptive event trigger controller design. Okay, these are the results that preliminary that we, we have done. So these are pretty much with the one single DC microgrids where you have photovoltaics, uh, supercapacitor storage, battery storage, and then this is the residential load. So basically it's a local control. So you try, there's a, a PI controllers here, the PI controllers there and there. So what we do is try to use the a different kind of uh, uh, techniques to optimize the PI parameters. So we use three different ways. This is the convention methods, okay? Where you look at the voltage of power, and this is the current. So the voltage is trying to follow the reference, but there's a big overshoot 
over here when we change the level of the power and the level of PV as you know as well as the how the battery react and, and supercapacitor react when you know when you have a power this is your load and then these are the PVs supply the blue one and then these are the uh, capacitors and then these are the batteries so at the beginning you can see from the first one second you there's a more bv so the battery will be uh, charging and then when you have less or more power but less bv then you are looking at the battery discharge so you can but with all these changes there's an overshoot in terms of a lot of these voltage because it's keep changing, but it goes back to the, the reference, but still the very high overshoot. Then we do with what we call a gray wolf optimizer. You try to optimize the PI parameters. Then we can see, we run the similar things and then we actually reduce a lot in terms of the overshoot. As then at the end, we combine the hybrid between the particle swarm optimization and gray wolf optimizing. Then a, big, a lot more uh, 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 better control. You know, the voltage being regulated nicely and the power actually very smooth and, and so on. Okay, so that's the first time. Then we increase the complexity by having because those are only local, so it's easier to do. Now we are doing two uh, clusters. So this is one cluster, this is another cluster. So they have their own local controllers where you have the using the grid wolf optimization. And then we have this, what we call the global controller, yeah? where you have to have the consensus algorithms there. So these are what you're looking at. So you're looking at the two different uh, controller. One is to power, to control the, to regulate the power. One is to regulate the voltage. And then again, you have a gray wolf on this side and gray wolf here. Then this one go to local layer. So again, this is what I call the modified consensus because the, con the original consensus is only using the conventional PI. So what we do, we just put the, instead of a conventional PI controller, we just put the G, uh, Gray Wolf here to, to fine tune the PI con, uh, parameters. Again, we look at the two different results. One, the conventional consensus algorithms, and the other one is the modify with the, you know, with the Gray Wolf inside there. Again, we are looking at the overshoot in terms of the voltage regulator. So again, it's, it's, it's a lot better. So that's come to our conclusions. So with this one, is you, need, you need to have, we know that you have to coordinate these clusters, okay? It's, it's something that we have to, so as a main focus, we have done through all the different kind of issue, different uh, controls, methods that is uh, assisting. Then we try out with something very simple. Then we know that, you know, it's going to work. Something is going to work. And we have published some of them here. Okay, one uh, paper has been published in the ISGT Asia, and then one being published in energy journals in terms of all this, what I just uh, presented. So if you want to uh, more go more detail, you can look at all those two papers. Now I would like to acknowledge this is actually the work of mine, one of my PhD students, and he, Asked, he helped me to prepare these presentations, and uh, and then he. I like to also acknowledge that for the financial uh, uh, 
support from Al Furat Al Saud Technical University and then also the MBIE SSIF ATP project, you know, which is in terms of architecture of future low carbon resilient electrical power system, as I mentioned earlier. So this is a seven year of uh, government funding project. You're looking at uh, a power system with a low carbon in the future. Thank you. I hope I do not run over time. Thank you, Professor Lee, for your uh, wonderful lecture and finishing it in time. So already some questions are there in the chat box. Uh, Asin, can I read those questions? For, uh, for uh, Professor Lee, I, I, I think I can read and we can answer. Yeah. Okay, so there is first question, is there any alternative way to solve microgrid problems and why we can't expand it? Do you understand my question? Yes, yes. Well, there is, uh, uh, there is no alternative way in a sense that, you know, if it is, you're looking at microgrids, you have different control. Of course, you can have, uh, uh, different way to control. Because when you look at microgrid, we're looking at DC. What I'm looking at in this one is more or like all this power conditioner, okay? All these converters, inverters kind of things. So they have their own controller. Now these are the things that you can do to improve. There are different way to, to, to design the controller for it. However, if you have more than one microgrids, nearby so if you are all power system are all interconnected so you you may have problems because you have your own control in your own local uh, microgrids and then you've got another control on the other microgrid they could be a problem they are trying to fight each other so how are you going to control uh, coordinate the two so there's a lot of ways to do that. One is, is what I have talked about, which is how you do that and all you want to do decentralize, centralize. So those are the different ways of doing that. Uh, what we think the best way is to do the hierarchical or you know control where you have a local, you have your own locals, and then you got the global, where you have the global, they got two layer in the global, you got the third, secondary and the tertiary where you can have different way of controlling it. Again, there are so many control techniques you can use. I mean, I'm just putting up there a different way you can do that. Okay, whether you want to use the conventional classical control or you want to do the heuristic way or you want non-heuristic way. So that's, that's, yeah, that's what, I hope I answered that question. Okay, so there is a second question. Okay. Uh, here you said that it requires less energy because of sensor and it will work when it needs to work. But uh, if the customers is high enough, then uh, will it work properly or not? If, uh, <laughs> Can you get okay. the question? Can you repeat if, that again? If the customers, I, I think he wanted to say, if the number of customers are higher, mm -hmm. uh, then will it work properly? Yeah, it will. I mean, it will because, you know, if, I mean, nowadays uh, technology is that the sensor is very good. So if you have numbers of sensors, you can sense it, you know, it depends on, on where it was. If there's a lot of microgrids, uh, it should be able to work again. We have not tried how many in terms of the limitations. So it could be, you know, there could be a delay somewhere, maybe, because if you have too many, there could be a problem. So that one, yeah, it could be a problem, uh, but I'm not very sure because we have not done the study yet how many we can have in terms of before we actually have problem with the sensors, with the communications. 
Okay, so uh, there is another question. Is it possible to achieve uh, fully decentralized control with the local measurements for a microgrid clusters? Fully decentralized control, is it possible to achieve? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think so. Uh, it is possible. It is possible. The only problem is you may have a little bit of problems when you are, uh, because you know, if you're a different region, you rely on different renewables, energy sources. For example, you got the BV and the wind. So in some region, you got more wind than the other or more sun than the others. So you may not be able to uh, take advantage of having it, you know, uh, to share among them. If you're really decentralized, you actually live within your own uh, aspect of it. I mean, it's possible if you have a good battery storage system and all that, so you don't rely on other people, that's fine. Yeah, it could be done, but it's more expensive. Okay, so another question is, uh, how many hierarchical levels you should suggest for hierarchical control? How many? Well, uh, that is I optimum mean, number of hierarchical level. Is there it's any only, Yeah, it's only two tertiary uh, and uh, it's only local, okay, and then secondary and tertiary. So it's, it's that, that's about it. Okay. So I think uh, we are also uh, in the end of our time. So if you have any more question, you can put your question in the chat box or QA chat box. That is, I, I got one more question in the chat box. Mm -hmm. In terms of cost, which control method is preferred? In terms of what again? In, in terms of cost. I cost. mean, expense, expense, uh, expensive. Expensive, uh, I, I mean, in terms of cost. Well, I think, yeah, of course you're looking at, uh, yeah, I think nowadays, it depends on what you you application uh, areas. Uh, uh, yeah. Based. So I mean, in terms of the cost, usually, I mean nowadays with the processor, uh, you know, I don't see any problems. And the good thing about you know having a, a, a this processor, you can actually program it. So I don't think there's any issue of that. Now uh, there's another question in terms of. The AI, I mean, application, I mean, you can always, in our case, we just uh, use, you know, the, because the PI is pretty much the classical control. Uh, and the, the how good the PI control work is rely on how good your PI parameters are, you know, your gain, KP and KI. So that one you can use. AI. So for, for our case, we use the grid work wolf, or you can use a neural network, or you can use other things to get the optimal uh, parameters. That's what I think. Okay, think. So, uh, yeah. and I think uh, we are in the end. So uh, one audience has raised hand. Mohammed Shofiul Lalom is a faculty of IIUC. Uh, okay. Dr. Shofiul, do you want to ask any question? You raised your hand. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lee, for his kind and informative presentation. Uh, just I have one question, Professor. Uh, okay. Regarding the uh, optimization, I mean, for the PI optimization, normally yeah. we need the objective function. Yes. And uh, if we want to optimize it, if we need a complete mathematical model. This is the one way. And another right. way, we can run the simulation and we can take the, uh, uh, for example, any error and we can get back to that. So actually, what process uh, did you do uh, for your uh, case for PI, uh, oh, for optimization? We, we use an uh, objective function. Uh, I mean, a complete mathematical model, right? Yes. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, I, I got one question and I should uh, use it as the last question for okay. this session. Uh, how can we incorporate AI applications in these classical problems? And uh, he also asked another question side by side. Uh, how can we take the advantage of uh, dealing with data in DC microgrid clusters with AI? 
Yeah, I think, okay. Uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, I think uh, previously, but you know, you can use the AI, uh, you can use different uh, way of doing that. Okay, you can train the system. For example, you have different system, you run different uh, parameters in a system, you train the network, you train the controller using, you know, uh, neural networks or, or many other ways to do that. To AI, then you can use that to replace the controller. That's one thing. The easy way that, you know, what I did, not really easy, but it, the one that we develop, uh, we use the mathematical models, as I mentioned earlier, and then uh, define the objective functions, and then we try to optimize it using the gray wolf optimization. So there's another thing that we can always do that. And what is the second question again? Uh, uh, how can we take the advantage of it in DC micro? Ah, okay, so what you can see all the data that you have, there's another things that we are looking at at this moment, because uh, you, you have a lot of data that's coming in and out in the microgrid. Sometimes you do not know where is it coming from. So, I mean, you can use uh, what we call the data science. Uh, I mean, what I have another project we're looking at, try to, to, to use this data and try to mimic it with the digital uh, kind of uh, uh, model. Okay, what we call or, or known as, I think the trend nowadays, they use the word digital twins. So you have a, actually a, not really a physical model, but it's a digital model that you, you can actually uh, run it and know what is happening in the in the microgrids without even knowing the, the physically so that's something that you can take advantage of okay I don't, know whether, you, whether, I don't know whether i answer the questions okay 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 thank you professor Tech, uh, jing li for your wonderful sessions and taking part in the live discussion and question answer session and with this, uh, I think uh, I can uh, end my session and I can now invite Professor Muhammad Abu Yusuf to start the second session with Professor Faisal Hussain. So thank you, Professor Tech Lee. Thank you Once very again. much for, for all your patience to listen to me. Thank you. Thank uh, you all. I hope it's useful. Thank you, Professor Tech Lee, and sir. thank you to our Professor Dr. Mohibul Hagbhaiya. And now, uh, before we start the next session, I would like to ask our Professor Tech to wait for a little until we finish the next session and then the certificates will be shown by the volunteers who are waiting. So if you kindly give us time to until we finish the next session. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So and now, uh, can I get the permission to share the slide? Yes, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I can share now. Uh, I hope the screen is on. Yeah. So for the second session, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Faisal Hussain. Uh, he's Professor John R. Kille and old professor and from civil and engineer environmental engineer from University of Washington, Seattle, USA. So I would like to invite our professor, Dr. Abu Yusuf. He is the head of Department of Civil Engineering at uh, International Islamic University, Chicago. So I will leave it to the professor, Dr. Abu Yusuf. And uh, please, sir, uh, sorry, it's in the panelist. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sir. So okay. Just, uh, unmute. Okay, I hear you now. So I will leave, to, leave it to Professor Dr. Muhammad Abu Yusuf and welcome you all to the second session. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, Dr. Rasimullah. Uh, and thank you, uh, Prof. Tech uh, Jing Lee for your very wonderful presentation for us and for our audience. Alhamdulillah, dear intellectual audience, now, I am taking an opportunity to introduce a, an engineering scientist, Professor 
uh, Dr. Faisal Hossein. He is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Washington, USA. His research focuses on the sustainable water resources engineering, building capacity and training for resource constraint in nation and institution. His work has resulted in satellite management system in several nations across Asia for improved water, food, and energy security. He received his PhD from the University of Connecticut and his MS from National University of Singapore. Alhamdulillah. Dear honorable audience, now I am taking an opportunity to uh, welcome honorable professor in engineering as a keynote speaker. And his keynote title is Producing More with Less Using Sensing, Information Technology, and Machine Learning. We are, we are very much excited to present such a wonderful engineering scientist on hydraulics, hydrology, and water management. And we are gratefully uh, congratulate him. Now, Professor Dr. Faisal, your time start. Okay. Most Thank welcome. You so much. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for the uh, very kind introduction, uh, Dr. Abu Yusuf. Greetings from Seattle. Um, as mentioned, my name is Faisal Hussain. I'm a professor at the University of Washington. First of all, I want to begin by thanking the uh, organizing committee uh, of IUC for this excellent conference on international conference on innovation in science, engineering, and technology. And uh, I feel deeply honored to be invited uh, for this uh, conference to give a talk. So let me just begin by sharing my screen now. So yes, sir, I, I stopped my sharing so you can share. Yeah. Yes, okay, yeah. So I'll just begin by sharing mine. And uh, for the slideshow, without further ado, I'd like to get started. So yes, as mentioned, you know, the, some of the areas that we've been trying to work on is on trying to produce more with less uh, for the sake of sustainability using sensing, the data we get from sensing information technology, and of course, with a little bit of machine learning. So I will try to share with you some examples here, and I hope uh, you will see some potential opportunities to, uh, you know, collaborate or move forward with it. So first of all, um, if you think about, you know, from a big picture perspective, uh, the, the major resources that we need as humans to maintain our civilization, we need energy, we need food, we need water. Of course, you can also say we need health and other uh, resources too, but these are the three key ones and they're connected to each other. And um, one of the challenges we face is of course, you see in the middle, our population's increasing, uh, soon by 2050, we'll probably exceed 9 billion. And one of the trends we see is that, of course, mm. there's the march towards no, urbanization. And uh, we are actually living increasingly in bigger cities, larger cities, cities becoming mega cities. And these are all basically very densely packed settlements. And these are a hub for resources, energy, water, and uh, food, uh, you also need to ensure ecosystem services and health services. So me, I mean, I am mostly a water resources engineer. I'm a hydrologist, as mentioned, I use a lot of sensing, modeling, and I try to work with uh, water managers. So I put water in the middle, fresh water, and there's some inter, uh, there's some cross-cutting uh, connections here. And as this demand for these resources increase, the demand for fresh water increases as well. And um, you know, one of the solutions we as human beings have done, if you look at the slide on the lower left is to make sure we have a steady and reliable supply of fresh water, we have been trying to build 
dams. So dams are basically nothing but a battery for water. So you can you know, tap into the water when naturally it's not available, the season is dry. And then when you have, think you're gonna have too much, um, you use it to store it to prevent yourself from getting flooded. So you see over the last 60, 70 years, our storage of dams has increased dramatically, especially after the Second World War. So you can see in terms of the storage on the y-axis, it's so many thousands of cubic kilometer. To give you a perspective, that's like three to four centimeters of the ocean's water. If you just scooped it and put it behind dams, that's what we would have. And of course, what we see these days is we're building more and more of these infrastructures for holding water in the developing countries as opposed to the developed country. This is what this chart indicates. So the tools that we have at our disposal, we have many tools, but I'll just focus on perhaps two types. One on the left side is we have now a plethora of sensing, uh, especially from space. Uh, we've been launching them, maintaining them since the 70s. They all looking down on earth, they're taking a pulse of the planet Earth, as far as say, what's the temperature of Earth, what clouds you have, what's the precipitation, um, you know, how high the water is, what's the vegetation, like all that. So we've got numerous satellites. And by some estimate, I think we're getting a petabyte scale of data streaming in almost every day. Just on water alone, we get about, I think, uh, 12 terabytes of data a day from these satellite missions. Then on the right side, we have a lot of models that mimic reality. Um, without going to the specifics, we have models like say hydrologic models that can, you know, you force them with some weather data and what you get as output is you get a prediction of say how wet or dry the soil is or how much water is in the river and the stream. And you, you also have these global models that we run in 3D, um, X, Y, Z, and T. Uh, numerical weather prediction models or climate models um, that can uh, predict the state of weather, the atmosphere, and even forecast. So these are what we have at our disposal. And what I'll try to show you is basically three examples, one on food, the other one on energy, mainly hydropower, and the last one on just water, and how we can apply sensing um, big data information technology with models and some machine learning to try to produce more with less. So more food with less, more energy with less. And of course you can't really naturally produce water on its own, but try to manage water with less effort or make it more efficient. So let's talk about food now. And I'll show you one real world example that we've been working on. So just if you focus on this, this map that you see in front of you, and let's say we focus on Asia, we've got a lot of extensive irrigated systems out there. What this map shows you is basically wherever you see the color red, um, that is a region where you're using a lot of water compared to regions that has a lot less red to produce the same amount of food or kilocalories of food. So you can see that that red or the amount of water needed to grow food is obviously higher in regions that are drier or hotter or arid. Um, but in general, you do see that many places that could be optimal in the use of water are not as optimal compared to other regions. And there is actually, um, you know, you'd be surprised to know that there's actually tremendous wastage of water that is being used to irrigate fields to grow the same amount of food. So there's wide disparity in how efficient we are with the usage of our um, water to grow food. For example, I'll give you an example here. This is for the case of Indus Valley in Pakistan, which has the world's largest irrigation system designed by the British in the early 1900s. So when it was designed in the 1950s after independence, it was designed to provide irrigation water, this irrigation system that the country of Pakistan had just for one growing season or one crop a year. And for that, they had enough water in the rivers, in the surface uh, water. And population back then was barely less than 40 million. Today in 2020, you know, um, the country has to produce at least two to three crops a year um, because the population has increased many folds. It's almost more than 200 million, I believe now. And the surface water 
that you have in those rivers in that country is just not enough um, to grow that amount of food because the system, the irrigation system wasn't even designed for that. So there is a net deficit. So what's really been happening is um, in this region, they're tapping into water underground um, and using as much groundwater to supplement the def uh, address the deficit in ir irrigation water. And, and essentially what we have seen is that because farmers historically have never um, known how much to apply optimally, um, they actually have been over pumping the water from the ground and depleting the groundwater resources to a level that is not getting replenished naturally. So the idea we have here, which we have implemented is, uh, we have a lot of sensing satellites, we, let's call them you know, earth observing satellites that can actually tell us about precipitation or rainfall current and in the past. And we can also take a pulse of the atmosphere, the temperature, the humidity and all that. And using that, we can actually estimate something called crop water need. For those of you who know what that term is, or um, you, you know that this basically is the demand for water that the crops need to grow uh, the food. And, and if you're not familiar with the term, it's basically look at it as a term that you can calculate if you know what crops you're growing and what state it's at and which region you're at. And if you know the weather conditions, you can basically find out how much water needs to be applied, which is a piece of information that farmers historically have never had access to. And then another thing we can do is we can use models so we call numerical weather prediction models where we can also predict the state of rainfall and weather, but we can forecast ahead of time. And that can be quite valuable to farmers if you can forecast conditions you expect a week or two weeks from now. So the idea we have is why don't we just, um, you know, uh, figure out what the irrigation needs are, the demand is, and what the supply is. So essentially when the demand for water uh, to grow crop is more than the natural availability, we tell the farmers via SMS messaging on their cell phone is, okay, you need to irrigate. But if there happens to be such a condition, which is quite frequent where rainfall is forecast in the horizon, or the crops actually do not have such a strong demand for water and that is already enough or can be met from available water if it's less than the supply. You actually try to warn the farmers, hey, you can go easy on irrigation. You actually can skip it and save some water. You don't need to pump the groundwater. You don't need to spend fuel. Most of it is fossil fuel. You don't need to increase the cost of farming. So demand here is of course crop ET, it stands for evapotranspiration supply is rainfall or extra irrigation. So this is kind of how the system looks like, which you build end to end is you send these messages to farmers like dear farmer would like to inform you that your wheat crop does not need irrigation due to this. And we've added a forecast component to it. So because this was done in Pakistan, you can see this is in the local language, Urdu. And we work with the local stakeholders the, uh, and the government agency responsible for water resources management. And the journey began in 2016 on a pilot scale with 700 farmers. And now, um, you know, it's scaled nicely to about almost, it depends, but any given time, there are 40,000 farmers getting the message, but sometimes it's 100,000 farmers. And the government is now um, independently managing this co-developed solution with University of Washington where we provide a lot of, at the back end, the technical expertise and the support that they need. So this is an example where we have meshed basically a lot of data from sensing, from satellites, modeling, to use forecast and information technology to put it all together to help farmers minimize the use of water or you make it use optimally so that with the same amount of water, they can actually grow more because you may know that over irrigation is actually a very bad thing. It actually reduces your yield of crops among other things that it has. So there was an impact evaluation done. And um, after this 
system ran for a couple of years and uh, one evaluation done by the government is that they think they're saving about 40% of irrigation water uh, per 100,000 farmers, which I think is a pretty significant number because what this means is if you keep doing it on a national scale for years and years, you give the groundwater aquifers a fighting chance to gradually build up its stock uh, by getting replenished by natural uh, availability of water from the monsoonal rains. Um, this amount of water is two and a half cubic kilometer. If you want to get some perspective, especially for those in Bangladesh, this is like half of the water that's stored in Kaptai Dam, which is I think very near to where many of you are in uh, IUC. I use Grand Coulee Dam because that's the nearest dam I have in the state of Washington. It's one of the largest dams in the United States, 11 cubic kilometer. And uh, you know, just because you send text messages doesn't mean for all the farmers will respond to it or act on it. We found out that such a system has about 80% usage. We've never been able to get 99 or 95 or 100% usage, uh, mainly because those other farmers, we believe were much more well-to-do, more affluent, or did not feel like they had to conserve water. Now we could have addressed their needs, but there's a chance that we might have alienated these other 80% farmers because the system is by design very simple uh, and uh, easy to use. And we've had uh, some evidence that farmer income has also increased by as much as 100%. Now, all this is great, but one of the things for those of you familiar with South Asian uh, food production system, you may know that um, the food production system in Pakistan that has the world's largest irrigation system is quite different from rest of South Asia, whether it's India, Nepal, or Bangladesh, in the sense that um, you know, Pakistan has a very well-managed crop management plan. So whenever they are growing a certain type of crop, they're only growing that crop for tens or you know, hundreds of miles. But that is not the case if you go to India or Bangladesh. If you look at this picture on the lower right, I think you will all agree if you go out and look at the fields outside is that we've got these very small and irregularly shaped plots of farmers. And yes, most of the time we're probably growing rice or a certain type of crop, but oftentimes there's tremendous variability in even the crop type. And then there is tremendous variability in the plot size. Plots are very small, actually less than an acre or sometimes less than you know, 100 by 100 meters. So essentially what you need is you need hyper-local information. So the previous system that I just alluded you to based on satellite sensing, and numerical models, that's actually very coarse resolution. That can work in regions where you have, you do not have any variability spatially for tens of kilometers. So if you're, if you're happening to grow say banana or maize for tens of kilometers, it's fine. But if you're growing banana here and then the next farmer's plot, you know, maybe barely 50 meters across is growing say mustard, or corn, that idea that I just showed you will not work. So we need something further and we, we need to take adva advancements of information technology. So we partner with some you know, brilliant experts of ECE, electrical computer engineering, and we came up with a system that combines these satellite sensing you see here where I'm moving my laser pointer, uses also the numerical weather prediction model, but it adds another thing called low powered wide area network. This is really not in my expertise. These are electrical engineering folks came up with it. This is basically low bandwidth, but it's low energy and it's internet of things. You can put sensors there and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. And it can give you some hyperlocal information that you would need to figure out for every plot, the crop water demand or the plot specific information you need. And then you combine everything to give to a farmer who has a small plot, plot scale advisory. We call that system PANI, you know, it's an acronym, uh, provision for advisory or necessary irrigation. But PANI, as you know, uh, in the local vernacular in many regions in South Asia, including Bangla means water. So it turned out to be a nice acronym. So essentially the way it works is that 
you have um, these uh, in Internet of Things sensors. So I'm showing you one on the left, which is basically a soil moisture sensor. They're very cheap. Um, they cost less than $100. I believe they run on two AA batteries and you don't need much maintenance for a couple of years. And as they're sensing, they're actually relaying that information to a um, through a low powered wide area network to a router, which you, would, you can place anywhere uh, on a hang on a tree or somewhere. And that router itself, because it's low powered wide area network, um, it doesn't need much power. It can run on some solar panels. So here I have an integrated, in the middle is a uh, integrated weather soil sens sensor, which is IoT compatible. And here you have a IoT ready weather station. So if you put a lot of these at as many, you know, hyper local resolution as you can, then you get some information on the soil variability conditions that you can use to then convert your core scale information on crop conditions to a much more plot scale or hyper local scale. So that's what we did essentially. And it's again, the rest is the same. You send the messages to the farmers and you see the impact. So we piloted this in Northern India and then I'm just showing you some uh, results of the survey on Pani. Um, about 60% found some benefit, a 15% no benefit, obviously, they were not interested in the messages. And 26% found it very useful. And they were actually an overwhelming majority of them were potato farmers. Uh, so if you're familiar with potatoes, uh, one thing we didn't realize actually is a lot of farmers happen to be growing potatoes and they actually want to avoid irrigation if they can because Excessive moisture can cause blight. And once one potato has blight, it destroys the entire crop of potatoes. So they are actually very sensitive to not overwatering. And we did some uh, tests as well. Um, the farmers were mostly growing yield, uh, wheat, winter wheat. Uh, so we did see some increase in uh, yield uh, compared to the government historical record. So that's about the food part where I've shown you, you know, how we can use sensing from satellites, information technology, IoT sensors, low, low power, uh, you know, wide area network, and you put them all together with model data, create a nice system where you can get the knowledge base uh, directly to the farmers so that they can make a more informed decision to use water optimally, increase their production, and also achieve some, some semblance of water sustainability. So let's talk a little bit about energy. And in energy, um, I wanna show you an example, but that focuses more on hydropower because you know, myself being a water resources engineer, hydropower, you know, it aligns with the water aspect of what we do in our profession. So just generally, if you look at this plot, um, this is basically showing, you know, in terms of number of people, uh, who do not have access to electricity as of 2016. And um, this is in, in, in a percentage fashion what you see. And uh, one sad fact, I guess, is in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, that percentage of population with electricity has actually gone up. While in Asia, it's actually gone down compared to in early 1990s and other regions, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, unfortunately, it's increased. And some other examples. So if with, within energy, if we just focus on hydropower, if you look at to the left, Brazil and China, uh, Canada, I think are the two superpowers of hydropower. They're getting a lion's share of their energy from hydropower. You can see 30 or 40%. Other countries where there are a lot of dams um, and there are a lot of hydropower production, but the net, um, percentage in their energy portfolio is around 10% or so. Like China, it's gone up a little. India, it's gone down. United States is very interesting. It's been steady all along um, because, of course, they're not adding any more hydropower dams. And, you know, that's also looked upon as not something uh, that is um, favored due to all the environmental regulations because dams do also have negative impacts. So on the right hand side, you can see a timeline of how hydropower generation capacity has increased um, since the 1960s and to 2019. So 
one thing, the example that I want to show you here is about hydropower. And I think most of you probably know from first principle is that a dam that is trying to generate energy uh, through running the water through the hydropower turbine, the objective is always to keep the water at the highest level possible behind the dam so that you can convert that potential energy into kinetic energy. Now, on the other hand, that will compete with the other goal of the dam, which is flood control. So if you want to do flood control, you actually have to keep the water level as low as possible so that the incoming flood can be stored behind the dam and then released gradually. So how do you, you know, um, maintain the two and have some balance and still are able to make your hydropower generation efficient? This was our challenge. So what we thought is, you know, we want to have a system for efficient hydropower operations where we think about sustainability, security, scalability. But for the sake of time, I'll focus mostly on using forecast of weather and how that can optimize, in fact, maximize hydropower production without compromising flood control. But I do want to say that this is part of an overarching framework because you know, whenever you talk about use of water for, for say growing food or for generating power or to do flood control, you have to keep in mind the ecosystem. Uh, you have to keep in mind sustainability, scalability, safety, and you're trying to do optimization. And one thing that we, I'll show you here um, just as an application is we try to use some AI techniques so that we can really forecast in a very efficient and uh, fast way um, what the conditions will be in the dam. So our idea is this, we can forecast how much water will go into the dams because we can forecast the weather. So we can forecast through a model how much inflow will go into the dam. So we will use these numerical weather prediction models. We'll also use remote sensing. And normally, at least historically, you know, traditional water management or hydropower generation, we normally do not use forecast information to optimize our hydropower production. So what we're seeing here, saying here is that if the dam operator knew what the conditions would be for the next, say, 10 days or 20 days, as far as how much inflow would come in and, um, what, how much he would need to store or release, then that forecast information could be used to optimize hydropower production while also making sure flood safety is met. That's, that's the whole idea. Normally that's not happening these days because you're pretty much kind of acting according to what we call rule curves, which are very static rule curves. Okay, it's the flood season, Okay, you keep the water level low, forget about hydropower production, your focus is flood safety. Now it's not the flood season, it's the dry season. Think about storing more water and generating more hydropower. So we did an application on two dams for this idea. And basically the flow example is like this and the flow chart on the left is you use the weather forecast, you have to downscale it a little bit, put it through a model, uh, it's called Vic model, um, which will predict your inflow into the reservoir. Then you do some optimization. The optimization is such that you wanna maximize hydropower, but you wanna minimize flood risk. How do you do both? So you have to have all these constraints in your optimization. And we applied the technique on two specific dams that are run by the US Army Corps of Engineers. One is in Detroit, Oregon, not Detroit, Michigan, by the way, it's called Detroit Dam. And then the other is Pensacola, Oklahoma, uh, it's also managed by a local uh, dam operating agency there. And on the right side, these curves that you see, these are what tr is traditionally used by the dam operators. So depending on what month they're at, they will keep the levels at that you know, prescribed conditions. What we are saying is now, hey, we can forecast the conditions. So you don't necessarily have to follow this curve. You can actually follow what your optimization is telling you so that you get more juice for your hydropower without compromising flood safety. So let's look at the um, results. So we use something like a Pareto optimality where our goal was not to compromise flood safety. 
while, all, while also to maximize hydropower production. So we kept maximizing until we saw that flood safety was getting compromised and you stopped there. And the general finding was that whenever you have a flood season and you're expecting a lot of water to come into your hydropower dam, that's when your forecast information is incredibly valuable to get to generate extra hydropower while, while maintaining your flood safety uh, goals you have. Because I mean, it's common sense in some ways, if somebody were to tell you, okay, the next 20 days, this is what you can expect, then you can do some early preparation to maximize your turbine operations and get more power and make sure also that you're not flooding downstream. On the right side, what I'm showing is that we ran these experiments and we actually used actual data from these dams and for about a year. And um, um, these uh, kind of pink bars that you see here are times when you get some additional hydropower when there is a flood wave coming. But the basic summary is that just with, by virtue of using forecast information and without really having to do much, you're not adding anything structurally, you're not adding additional turbines, all you're doing is you're tweaking a little bit of your dam operations. You're trying to store a little bit early or you're trying to release a little bit early. That's all you're doing according to your optimization. And we see that it's very easy to get anywhere from five to 6% throughout the year. That's an annual average. Uh, of hydropower. So, um, you know, this was one of the findings. And the other thing was the technique itself, because if you go back, you know, this um, approach of using a model to forecast how much water the dam uh, will receive can be computationally very expensive. So this is where we use some artificial intelligence. Basically, it's a neural network based, you know, con convolutional neural network CNN approach where you train based on past data, and then you predict and forecast your flow rapidly without going through a computer model that has a lot of CPU cost to it. That way the dam manager has lots of scenarios uh, generated very quickly and he or she can decide which one to follow. So kind of the takeaway from the energy aspect of uh, our work is that weather forecasts do have a benefit to help us generate more hydropower while also maintaining flood safety. And they tend to be more beneficial during peak flow, flow events. And this is a relatively new concept in the business of hydropower production. It actually was first floated in 2015 or 16. And it's only now that it's trickling into the hydropower industry and they're thinking about um, you know, using weather forecasts using models, using artificial intelligence, sensing data to make their operations more efficient. Okay, my last example is water. And I tried to keep, keep the best for the last. Um, and I'll show you just a, a more global example that we have embarked on. And this comes back to the issue of dams. So what you see in front of you is, um, you see locations of major dams. I mean, right now we have way too many dams like into the millions, but the really large ones. And the blue ones are the ones that already exist. And where you see red is the ones that are being planned or under construction or in the process of getting commissioned. And obviously you see a lot of red in developing countries, especially if you overlay it with the human development index, that pattern is quite clear in most parts of the world. And that's the region also where you don't have a lot of infrastructure on the ground, resources on the ground or systems or agencies that can manage uh, your water resources or have data or you know, measure your water in the streams and the rivers behind dams and all that. So our idea was because most of the regions where you're seeing hundreds and thousands of dams coming online, either in recent times or in the future, or dams that already exist, because they're in developing countries and because those countries lack the capacity to invest in systems or resources that can monitor what's happening, we thought we should use sensing from space, which is freely available. Satellites can actually track dams and we can use freely available models. 
And our question was, can we build a dam monitoring system globally that is publicly available and accessible to anyone with internet connection so that the dam conditions could be made open to anyone who wants to know how much did it receive, how much did it store, how much did it release, all that. So there is a kind of a schematic here. So it would involve, um, because it's, you're talking about a few terabyte scale of uh, processing every day, cloud computing. So Google has been pretty good about it. There's something called, you may know, Google Earth Engine for sensing data. So it provides a free option of running everything in the cloud. So you don't have to download these terabyte or petabyte scale data every day from satellites. You put them in your hydro models and then you predict or forecast what flow will go into the dam. At the same time, use a lot of sensing data from satellites uh, to look into the condition of the reservoir behind the dam. Like how, what's the surface area like, or what's the height like, elevation like. And if you have two successive such observations, then you can immediately estimate what we call storage change. Um, so if you, let's say you had a scan today and the area was 20 square kilometer and tomorrow you had another scan from satellite that was 25. You know that the surface area increased by five square kilometers and all dams have this relationship called elevation versus area. And you can estimate the volume change. So you get the volume change, you get the inflow, then you can do the outflow through a simple mass balance. So without going into too much detail, we launched such a system and it was mainly for NASA. Um, you know, it's, I think, the world's first um, publicly available um, big data system that uses sensing satellites models to model about roughly 1,598 dams continuously almost every day in these locations where you don't really have a lot of ground data or systems. And we're using uh, data from about eight NASA satellites. And it was based on a lot of R&D and we've made it publicly available. So if you have a chance now, you can go to this website, satellitedams.net and check it out. And um, you know, this is what it's providing. So what it's providing right now is if you just click on the location, you get to see, um, say the inflow or you click on storage change, you get to see storage change or outflow, you click on outflow, it says outflow, it's prediction, you get the historical record, also you get the most recent nowcast. We'll be adding future conditions very soon. So the goal of this tool, we, which we call RAT, Reservoir Assessment Tool, uh, is really been to democratize um, access to information on water, models on water, you know, sensing all put together so that any one individual or any agency or any entity who needs to manage water or know what's happening to the water around him upstream or downstream, they have that. So it levels the playing field by virtue of using the internet, cloud computing information technology. So I'll show you the last part of my talk is basically I'll show you, well, does such a grand global system make sense? So here's an example that I'm showing you. Here is for all those close to 1600 dams, um, we wanted to see if it passes the smell test or the sanity test. Like, is it really giving you something that is physically accurate and realistic? In the months of January, February, March, April, which I guess most of you, especially those of you who are in Bangladesh know that these are the dry months. These are not really the monsoon months, right? You don't get a lot of rainfall, barely much. Although these days we're seeing some rainfall in February too. So these are the months where dams typically um, tend to be um, almost, you know, like they tend to be losing storage because it's not raining. So water is not coming in, but that's the case in the Northern hemisphere. But in the Southern Hemisphere, these are the monsoon months. This is a wet season. So in the Southern Hemisphere, below the equator, you should expect dams to be increasing in storage, not decreasing because of the rain and the inflow and the, the water that would need to be stored for flood control and all that. And that's what we, we see here. So we we did a 30 year analysis from 1985 to 2015 using a satellite data called Landsat. 
and our reservoir assessment tool. And what you see here basically is wherever you see red or yellow, it means the dams there, they have been increasing in storage, so they're filling. And wherever you see green or light green, uh, you see that dams there actually have been losing storage because it's negative. Um, and so it makes sense. Now let's flip this. Let's go to the other side now, September, October, November, December. So that's most of the monsoon in Northern Hemisphere, such as in Bangladesh. And now you start seeing also trends that make sense. So in South Asia, now dams, because of the monsoon, they have started to fill again. So they become yellow, orange, or red. And uh, the ones in the Southern Hemisphere, because previously they were actually, you know, um, storing much more, they were more red, they start to become green now, or, or, you know, they start to lose storage because now it's the dry season for them. So yes, it did pass the sanity test and, you know, this is publicly available and there are many things we're doing with it for different agencies uh, around the world, especially in South Asia and in Africa and uh, hopefully soon in Brazil. So I'm coming to the end. And uh, you know the purpose of this talk has been to essentially show you that you know we have a lot of freely available sensing data, numerical models, and advancement information technology, uh, which using which we can monitor key resources. And uh, I think the onus is on all of us to develop these user-centric, need-specific tools uh, to manage food, energy, and water uh, using sensing IT and models, but also democratize and empower agencies so that we can benefit from all these wonders of technology that we have out there. So I wanna acknowledge my students here who all played a role one way or another and the uh, programs that have supported it. And um, I am now ready for questions. So I'll just stop sharing. Um, and, and I hope I was on time for you. So thank you so much again for giving me a chance to make this talk. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Faisal. Uh, very elaborate and uh, excellent presentation. It is very good for all civil engineers also. Uh, actually, I, I, I'm very much interested about environmental hydraulics. So this is uh, you can say I learned from you and this is very good for civil engineer also. And civil engineering is not a traditional engineering, it's no more. Now from this presentation, I think every could realize that a civil engineer can move any, anywhere. Uh, elaborated about food, our food chain, then energy, and then water. Very nice, excellent. We are in Chittagong, and very we are very close to Bay of Bengal, Karnafuli River, and so many other water resources areas. And he mentioned his presentation about the uh, Kaptai Lake, and then. Uh, this uh, Karnafuli River also. So I just, uh, uh, the, from the audience, and uh, Prof, I just inform you, we have only three batches. Now we are in the third semester. So our student are not uh, uh, introduced yet, uh, with uh, hydrology or hydraulics. It will be, I think, semester four coming. Uh, but I I uh, advise our student to join uh, today as an audience, then at least can get some information. And this is the way to learn. Okay. So I, uh, I just ask the audience, you can make a question. Okay. Now our time is question and answer. Okay. Thank you very much, audience. Please ask the question. And at this moment, I got one question. And the question, uh, uh, Prof, can you see this question? Uh, the um, Muhammad, yes? Mustafa Amir Faisal, he's our faculty at uh, ET, Electrical and Telecommunication Engineering. Yeah. So Mustafa Amir Faisal. Yes, yes. yes. I, I can see the question. So let me read it okay, for okay. everybody else. 
I'll answer it. Uh, Thank you. So the question is, how feasible is IoT, Internet of Things based irrigation prediction system for Bangladesh? This should optimize use of water resources and energy resources in Bangladesh for irrigation. What are the challenges that researchers should keep in mind if they want to work in this field? Your general advice is appreciated. So um, I, I would say from a technological perspective, IoT by virtue of being cheap and the fact that in Bangladesh, like most other countries, you have fairly deep cell phone penetration. I think at least for texting, I think 80 or 90% of the population has access to cell phone. And we actually do have a system running in Bangladesh with Department of Agricultural Extension. It's not IIT based, it's more the different system. So it is very feasible and it can be done. Uh, our work has involved working with the government, Bangladesh government, Ministry of Agriculture and empowering their capacity. So if you wanna make, um, if you wanna be aware of challenges, I think for researchers, oftentimes we do research in a vacuum without knowing what the needs are on the ground. So I suffered from that problem myself. And one way to avoid that is to be connected to stakeholders who are dealing with the problem every day. So in this case, we have worked a lot with um, sub assistant agricultural officers or SAOs. My recommendation would be, if you want to do research in this area, be connected to the farmers. You know, get to know in different regions, they have different challenges. They have different soil, they have different access to water. They have different pumping mechanisms and then customize your research so that the solutions are tailored for those needs rather than a one size fits all. And I think it shouldn't be that hard because Bangladesh already has an excellent government infrastructure for agriculture. It's really miraculous that the country still yeah. produces so much food uh, and feeds its mm. population. So thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Prof. Any more questions? So I don't see any other questions that related to me. Uh, if there is no more question, then we can bring it to end the session. And I think uh, Professor Abusif is also getting struggling to get connected. So I uh, I request the our volunteer uh, Zil Rahman to show the certificates. So I will just announce the end of the session. So thank you very much for all the moderators and uh, myself and give thanks to myself and also to Mahinuddin and uh, Assistant Professor Department of uh, CSC, IAC and uh, the session chairs, uh, Abu Yusuf, Professor Abu Yusuf and to Professor Dr. Mohubul Haq and a very special thanks to our uh, speakers, Professor Tak Tingli and uh, our Professor Faisal Hossein. And thank you everyone, all the attendants who attended. And please don't forget to give your sign in the attendance list. And hopefully we'll catch up the next sessions. And I request the volunteer to show all the certificate, please. One by one. This is a certificate for Professor Taking Lee. And the certificate for Professor Faisal Hussein. Thank you. For Professor Mabul Hagbuyam. Thank you very much. Uh, for Professor Abhishek. Mm -hmm. And for uh, our moderator, Mohamuddin. Thank you. And for myself. Thank you very much. It's okay. So uh, I bring it to closing. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And see you again. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Mm. thank you very much. <laughs>